Hello, everyone. Welcome. It is Wednesday, February 24th, and it's time for Cataloging Cocktails. It's your honest, no BS, non-salesy conversation about enterprise data management with tasty beverages in hand. I'm Tim Gasper, longtime data nerd and product guy at Data.World, and joined by Juan. I'm Juan Cicada. I'm the principal scientist here at Data.World, and as always, it is a pleasure to take a break during the week and have a good chat with uh, my, my partner in crime, Tim. And I am super excited today. I'm always excited. Always Wednesday, cataloging cocktails is, is always my, my big thing. But with my really good friend, Mohammed, Mohammed Osser. How are you, Mohammed? Doing well, Juan. How are, how's everyone doing in Austin? I know you've been through a lot over the last couple of, or last week at least. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll get to that. We're, uh, we're warm and we're dry and everything's good. So <laughs> good. Well, no I, I'm in water flowing. <laughs> I'm in Minneapolis and we were in a deep freeze and today it's like 45. And so this is like amazing weather. People are probably out in shorts and short sleeves. It's like, it feels like spring has almost arrived. All right. Well, just a reminder uh, here at Catalog and Cocktails, uh, we are being, rec we're recording right now. Uh, feel free to, you can keep your camera on or keep your camera off uh, as ever you want, but please be muted. The first 30 minutes, we're going to be having this uh, discussion. And then after the 30 minutes, we will stop the recording and we will have kind of open live discussion with Mohammed. Uh, check out our new website at data.world slash podcast. You can follow us on Twitter, we have a new Twitter handle, The Honest No BS Data. You can also follow us on LinkedIn. Uh, give us a review on Apple Podcasts and follow us on Spotify. Uh, and again, for folks who are just listening to us on the podcast, we record Cal and Cocktails live every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Central. Everyone's invited. We stop the recording at 4.30. And we also have our Slack community, slack.data.world. Anyways, that's kind of uh, organizational here. But let's start, start with uh, cheers, toasting. What is everybody drinking today? How about you, Tim? You go first. Well, uh, to your comment, Mo, I'm glad to have uh, water flowing and energy keeping my lights on. That's that that's got me happy. I'm, it's back to basics for me. <laughs> yeah, we had a we had a tough week, uh, uh, and um, I'm just enjoying. I actually made something interesting. Um, I love Waterloo. Well, I, I think they're here in Austin. I have Waterloo blueberry water, and I mixed it up with some passion fruit syrup. And I also got some Angostura bitters. That's my drink right now. And it's a nice, uh, it's actually a pretty nice hot day here in Austin. How about you, Mohammed? What are you drinking? What are uh, you I've got a little bit of passion fruit as well. It's, there's, a, there's a kind of coconut mixed with bubbly water, coconut water thing, and I love it. So I'm enjoying that. All right. So cheers for, for having water, for having energy, and just realizing that there's a lot of things that we take for granted. That's what we're cheering here for me. Fancy waters. Yeah. Fancy water. <laughs> Cheers. Fancy water. I got some passion fruit going too. That's the popular thing today. Yeah. I think so we did We got the funny question, our icebreaker question. Uh, so we were asked who would make a better CDO, Tim or Juan or me? I'm going to vote for Tim because Tim is a better, uh, Tim knows how to go deal more, more better with customers than me. I think, I don't know. What do we, Mohammed, we've known each other for a while. What do you think? You know, I think you you both complement each other well, right? So where Tim has strengths, uh, Juan has other strengths, right? And so it, together, I think you guys make a a, a a dynamic duo. So Tim, I think your ability to work and build, um, you know, these sort of cross-functional type relationships and kind of go do the commercial type of work, if you will. And Juan, you on the deep technical side, right? And so I think you need both for any data transformation to be successful. You need to get your business stakeholders all on board and you need to build the right technical architecture and bring in the, the right tools. And so I think combined, you're, you're definitely more powerful than separate. I'm, I'm already blushing. Like but I'm <laughs> well, let's, 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 let's kick this off. Wait, first of all, post in the chat, tell us where you're coming from. What are you drinking? What are you toasting for? And, and who's your favorite CDO? Uh, and with that, all right, Mohammed. You're, I'm super excited to talk to you because you're the chief data officer of McKinsey, right? This gigantic, amazing organization. And, and this whole, in the spirit of being honest and no BS, what's your honest, no BS definition of a CDO and what should they be doing? The floor is yours. Juan, it's a, it's a great question. You, you'll probably get a lot of different answers based on who you ask. Actually, like uh, it was probably a year or so ago, there was an HBR article 
on um, like, you know, the roles of a CDO. And I have to admit, like, I think I got forwarded from like 10 people and I think every CDO posted it. And <clears throat> it, it covered, you know, four or five different types of archetypes, folks who are truly just doing data governance, other folks who are doing data as well as analytics or so playing that chief data analytics officer, uh, other folks who are doing more of the data monetization, um, you know, some some data ethics types of roles as well. And so, and, and also data defender around like information security. And, you know, I, I'd be, you know, I think most CDOs will get questions across all of these dimensions, but ultimately they do have to select and choose areas to focus on to be successful. So uh, I'll just define it based on what I do. I see, I see uh, being a, a chief data officer as being a data entrepreneur within the organization. Oh. And a big part of that for me, it's, it's around three areas. It's around innovation. It's around understanding, you know, what are the data assets that you have? Uh, it's about partnering with the business uh, and your colleagues to understand how you can deploy them. Ultimately for us at McKinsey, that means, you know, how do we deliver um, client impact uh, through the use of data? And so data innovation is a big part of that, all the external data that's out there, how we build data assets and so on and so forth. The second thing I think about is data engineering and architecture. How do you actually have the right tooling technology and, and people to bring that data together uh, and support uh, your organization? And as you know, most organizations are, are large and are, have a federated model. We have that here at McKinsey as well. So we have data leaders and tech teams also in our different um, practices or divisions, if you will. And then the third area is data enablement. And this is around building the data culture within the organization, getting folks excited about what data is available, making sure that they're aware of it, building a data community and so on and so forth. So I, those are the three areas uh, that I focus on. And again, as I highlighted, it's really being the data entrepreneur, helping people see the potential and the value in the data, and then ultimately driving impact from it. And for me, it's leveraging in our clients. For, for others, it may be having you know your business stakeholders leveraging data more effectively to transform the way your organization works. I'm, I'm loving this whole uh, data entrepreneurship. And that's like the first question now. I'm like, we should start asking within organizations, like who's the entrepreneur within your organization that's doing stuff with data? And I think that's-, that's Yeah, who's really whole... spearheading the initiatives and the innovation, right? So, so from there, uh, let me just, part of the being, creating this entrepreneurship or this whole spirit is goes into driving culture. And this has always been a hard, a very hot topic. Uh, again, it always comes back, right? We're talking about different roles. The, 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 how do you build a culture of data? And what does that even mean, right? What does a data culture mean? I mean, you guys are just a gigantic organization with, I mean, I mean, you have so many people, like how do you build a culture on data? You know, I think it all, it all starts with knowing and, and knowing people and building your network. So my, my background too is I grew up within the firm. You know, I started out as an analyst and, uh, you know, I, I, for vast majority of my career, I've been at the firm. I, I did have a stint where I led uh, marketing analytics and data strategy for a large financial services firm as well. And the same thing is true when in that experience, it's ultimately data is almost like the lifeblood of an organization and it connects you with so many different people. And I think the success of leveraging data is also the people relationships that you have. So uh, let me just share with you a couple of the things that I've taken away. And, and, and one of the things I'll just reflect on too is that like I helped also get the analytics division at McKinsey going, McKinsey Analytics. And so during that process, um, I got to know so many of the different data scientists at the firm. I got to know many of our consultants, many of our leaders across the firm. and one of the key things now for me from a data culture standpoint is like it's on any given day i could be approached by five teams 10 teams you know many different individuals who all have questions hey i have this problem what data can i use who you know who can i support and i i do make it a point to build relationships with everybody even if that means me talking to them on zoom for five minutes or talking to them on slack for a couple of minutes and guiding them and getting to know them and the problem that they're solving etc so i do believe that building those relationships are at the core of starting and getting your data community going and showing that no matter what level you are in the organization, we're here to be your support. So that's one, but you know, I'm one person. So how do you actually build um, the true culture around the organization? And th that brings me to the second point, which is one of the early efforts we took was to say, 
we, we, are, we are a large organization. We have data champions or data experts across the firm in, in different geographies, in different, in different practices. How do we build a map actually of all the data experts we have within the firm? How do we get them together and build a data community such that if any consultant or any person at the firm has a question related to data, they know that they can turn to this community. And we started it, we called it the find the data community. And we started putting up all of the laptops, all of the lunch, kind of like the lunch rooms when you know, folks would go into the office, et cetera. Um, and e even emails, et cetera, we'd go on and say, hey, we're launching this community. Here are all the experts on it. And all of a sudden we started getting all, you know, a bunch of traffic, people asking about, you know, questions, uh, whether like, what are the total EV sales in a, you know, by, by city over time, right? And just all these different types of, and you'd be surprised, all different data experts from around the firm had answers. And all of, all of a sudden, this community has grown to be huge. We moved to Slack. It actually became the foundation for us to start then institutionalizing some of that knowledge. And so then we started formalizing that knowledge into a data catalog. We started building uh, an overview of all the data assets, those experts there that's integrated with our search engines internally. And we get thousands and thousands of users every single month who are now using and understanding who are the experts and getting access to data. And as you know, data itself is not the end, it's actually solving the problem. And so the expert oh, yeah. plus the knowledge of the data itself are what, what, what is needed to solve many of our client problems. And so that's the approach we've taken and so far it's been it's been great, but we've really started, I think, with a human-centered approach versus a technology-centered approach. That makes a lot of sense. You're really putting the relationships and the people front and center. And, you know, just to follow up on that, Mo, you know, how much of that was really bottoms up versus, you know, you and your team and the, and the programs that you're pushing uh, sort of had to do a little bit more of a top-down? What's the sort of balance there that makes all that happen? You know, I think you do need to have and set up the orchestration of it all. Mm -hmm. uh, you really do need to galvanize that community. You do need to help paint a, a vision forward around what's possible and get them excited. And so a big part was getting those, you know, while there are 300 data experts, about 60 of them were really, really, really closely involved as we were getting this going, where we were um, understanding the data that they dealt with uh, really kind of building an, an Excel version of kind of what are the data assets we have as a firm, et cetera. And those 60, you know, started, you know, getting the, the other 300 on board. And as soon as the community started and as soon as our, you know, and we're a very client driven firm, ultimately we are a client driven firm. And when client questions come up, I think everyone is really eager to say, how can we help support? And so when, when questions come in and people are asking about all these different types of data that are available, and I should be clear, these are all data sets that are like external data sets, kind of market data sets, right? Um, when people have questions around a lot of these market types of data sets, you know, experts can come in and help inform them. Here's what you should be thinking about. Here's the types of data that are relevant. And so it, it's a combo. And, and ultimately, I think my success in a central role is only there if, if the different groups um, have a problem that they're looking to solve and I can help accelerate them on their journey. So, you know, so it, how, it how can't be driven from the, it can't just be driven centrally. It has to be, it has to be mutual. So, so this is one of the things that we, we hear all the time is let's go democratize data, right? Yeah, we got to do that. And we want to give data access to everybody. Do you ultimately give data access to everybody? Is that the end goal or, 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 because at the end of the day, it's like, well, getting access to the data is not what you need. You really need to be able to go answer your business questions, get the insights out of that, and maybe just getting the access to the data by itself is probably not the best path for that. I mean, how do you guys do that in balancing this centralization and decentralization that you were talking about? So let me, um, I'm going to say two things here. They're, they're going to probably sound at odds with each other, uh, but so are so many things in the world, right, uh, that you have to balance together. Um, so the first is that, Ultimately, I think we all start with this opinion that, hey, let's, let's get all the data together. Let's like, provide access to the data. And then, you know, boom, we've solved the problem. And, and in reality, what you find out is even if you made the data available, um, the, the user who thought they would use the data, you know, a consultant, for example, like 
you know, they don't have, let's say, they, they don't know exactly how, all the fields of the data and it's going to take them 10 times longer than someone who actually knows the data and can slice and dice it. And ultimately what you learn is people want insights, you know, and they want less actually around the data, they want the insights. And so, so, so that's one thing to, to keep in mind. Um, but the second thing to keep in mind too is that you do also want to make data available at the same time. And what I mean by that is, so the fact that people want insights doesn't mean you shouldn't do that, you know, make the data available and create um, streamlined processes. But I would argue that for those, that there, there are different profiles of data users across an organization. There are likely folks who are sort of the insight consumers. There are the folks who are the analysts who are likely working and creating insights and sharing those. And then you've got like the data engineers and the, and, and the data scientists who are maybe building data sets uh, and they're doing more advanced analytics, predictive models, and then deploying those. Like let's say just, there's three. Now, the reality is, is even for our data engineers and our data scientists and our data analysts, wow, do they have to jump through so many hoops to work with data? Because if you actually think about salmon kind of swimming up river, right? And how many only, how few make it all the way, it's kind of like that with data. First, you don't know where the data is, then you need to get access to it. And then once you get access to it, you realize you don't understand what it is. And then you need to get the expertise to do it. And then you realize that you're, you, you need like a spark cluster to run out. And, and, and by, the, by the time there's so much friction there. So what I, what I consider is take a persona based approach, understand who are the different customers and start first with a mindset of building, I would say momentum using and delivering the most highest impact, impact insights to the consumers, which are your largest group, your largest persona within the organization are the, cons uh, the consumers. And they're going to- Should you start with the biggest person, with the, the, the highest quantity of personas or there could be a smaller group that's more influential? Well, it, it, I, think, I think it's ultimately though, see the, 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 it will depend. Ultimately, it will depend on your organization. If you have a bunch of analytics use cases you need to go deploy, then focus on the data scientists and engineers. If you're focused on, you know, for us, typically it's around the client impact piece. The insight generation is, is, a, is a huge part of that and ensuring that many of our clients are, are, are getting access to these insights, et cetera. That becomes more relevant, but it ultimately depends on your business, but it's good to prioritize who is that, that consumer that you're focusing on? And then be like laser focused in terms of how do you improve that journey for them? Um, and then, and continue to like, what I say is momentum is really important early on. I think many of us are probably familiar with efforts where um, people have built, you know, spent many years building architectures and then haven't really seen all the value coming from it or it's taken a long time to get there. And so momentum means like, you know, make sure the business consumers of that analytics, of those analytics or that data are really seeing some essence about getting really excited. That builds the case to invest further in building out your architecture. And then now when you build out that architecture and that technology, you've now created a higher metabolism. So build that momentum and it will get you this metabolism to now take data, use it more, efficiently and effectively and scale it through your organization. That makes sense. You know, and in your comments about uh, momentum have me thinking not just about sort of organizationally how you're empowering these things, but also, you know, technology momentum and, and sort of leveraging the trends that are going on in the space. I know, Mohammed, you've been thinking a lot about sort of what are the right technologies? What are the big trends? You know, just to transition a little bit, what do you, what do you see going on in the space? What do you see as the, you know, the big impactful things that are sort of changing how we're doing things around data? I got to say, I'm, I'm really envious of your position because you probably get to talk, chat with so many people, so many companies, big and small startups, like, yeah, what's next? What are we, what, what are you excited about? What should we get yeah. excited about? Yeah. I mean, I think there, there are three areas that I'm really excited about and, you know, I'm sure there are many others, but these are the ones that are kind of near and dear to me. The first one is thinking about data as a product. Uh, I'm happy to dive into that. The second is external data and how I think most organizations are really familiar. At the firm, we, we work with a lot of external data, but, and, and I've been on, I've also you know, led analytics at, at a large enterprise and you have a lot of internal data, but often you don't have a view in terms of what's happening with your customers outside. You don't have a view on what's happening with the market, but you know, how can that create a, a whole new perspective on how you run your organization? 
And then the third area is really humanizing data. Uh, in many ways today, data is, it's, it's technology, it's architecture. It's like, you know, getting data to flow from 10 different places to 10 different places. It, it honestly, it feels a bit, and you have, you know, it's just not a great user experience. It's really not. And so how, how do the, the next, when we think about the next phase of data, how do, how do tech companies, platforms, et cetera, really think about making it easier for these different personas to interact and work with data so it becomes a seamless experience. So those are the three areas I, I'm excited. Let, I have let, to let, let's, let's unpack those. Let's unpack yeah. those. And I think we're all seeing the chat, a uh, question in the chat. Let's unpack data as a product. What do we, what do we mean by this? Yeah. I think this is an emerging space. And I think you, you, you had a, a few guests on and you talked about data mesh and data fabric. And maybe this is like a cousin relative of, of one of those concepts. But the idea is that, you know, in many organizations, every, I think organizations have gone and they've invested in building data lakes, right? Over the last, I'd say five, six years, that's been the biggest piece. And we've seen the transition now from more Hadoop to more kind of, um, you know, using more of a object-based storage and then, you know, having a querying layer on top, et cetera. And so we're seeing, we're seeing even how the data lake's changing. But in practice, what do you have? You have an organization that's taking a lot of their different data from, from their organization, from their systems, and they're putting it in one place. And, you know, they're asking a lot of their data engineers to go figure out what all that data is, what it means, how the business operates it, and then, and, and then create, you know, analyses and reports on top of it. And I think it's worked. Um, I think there have been some great results from it, but I think we're still just scratching the surface. I think there's a huge opportunity to truly scale data and analytics. In order to do that, you have to start thinking about data as a product. And instead of throwing it into a lake, having the data engineers kind of learn about a document things on the fly, organizations can almost take a page from like, you know, I, I still remember the famous Bezos memo that said, hey, every service needs to be exposed as an API or you're not going to be working here anymore, right? It's almost like every organ, every part of the company has a data product manager and they understand the business, they, they, they understand kind of the business concept, what, what a customer is, what an active customer is, what an inactive customer is, you know, they've defined what an order is. And, and people say, well, that's, business glossary, et cetera. And to a certain extent, that's true. It is, but I actually think of it less from a business glossary standpoint, but I think about it as, you know, what we're doing within these organizations is that in, the, in these groups, we're starting to connect our data, create data models and, and really expose a refined set of data that is agreed upon by the business that represents how the business operates. And you can envision now different parts of an organization having these data product managers and they're they're connecting their data. You know, they could be using a knowledge graph, for example. I think that may be one of the leading ways, uh, that may be one of the emerging ways to do that, where they create these data models. And then they're linking it, in fact, to the, the, the data, you know, the relational data that might be underneath it. And um, they're now creating this platform where everybody in the organization can pick up and query the data and build on top of it. And so that's where I think data, that was, and, and what you also find is that the more complex and complicated analytics use cases do require your data to be connected. And the last thing you wanna do is have a team reconnecting, connecting and defining different terms and not really knowing the context. I think these need to happen sort of at an enterprise way. You will need some transformational analytics use cases to power the development uh, of some of these data products. Yeah, so you don't want to just keep on. Hopefully, this is not too much. Yeah, no, you don't want to keep reinventing the wheel over and over, and and defining things slightly different in different ways, and and you really want to get aligned, get connected, and get repeatable about that kind of stuff. Right? Yeah, and, and what you what you're seeing actually in the marketplace is that companies that are truly data companies, and I, when I mean data companies, I mean like truly they like they live and breathe and sell and create data. Many of them are turning to this model to manage their own data whether it be like, you know, folk, folks who, who or companies that focus on real estate data or on web extracted data uh, or on private business data, they're, they're, they're actually building these kind of data models that they can integrate data from so many different sources and then have a common, um, 
you know, a common data model that they use and then they make, a, they make available to their customers. And so they're, they're truly, they are data product companies. Now I'm also, I'm, I'm kind of making the point that, hey, organizations, if they want to scale their data, just like data product companies, they also need to start thinking about their data as a product. They need to have this data product manager. They need to start using some of these tools. It's a journey. Uh, and so anyways, that's just and, an example uh, so, of like we're, we're really seeing this happen. This, this is a reminder of our, our, our last episode with Sam Bale, right, from Great Expectations. He was like, well, there's a reason why we have subject matter experts, because they know more than you about a particular subject, more than the data engineer, right? And you go talk to these folks. And it goes back to people who listen to, listen, uh, listen to my talks or stuff, everything I bring up, this whole knowledge scientist. I think I am so bullish about th this is the role that we need. The way we're gonna go treat data as a product is the same way we do software, right? Why don't we treat data the same way we treat software? I'm not saying we go do exactly the same thing, but I mean, I've been having these conversations over and over again with and reminding people, we would never push code into a master branch without it being documented, comments, people do peer reviewed, there's tests, uh, it goes through CI, CD, but we do that for data all the time. I mean, I think just, Going through that mindset and, and, and making that making data a first class citizen, that's what we need to go do. And it's not just about the technology. The technology is there. It's about it's a it's a bigger people and processes ch uh, challenge. And I think it goes back to the whole culture of data that, that we were starting to talk about. Uh, it, yeah, and one I think ultimately you know it does have to be something that the organization strategically from sort of the executive level down they say, well, look. We're getting good value of our data, but if we truly believe we have 50 analytics use cases, 100 analytics use cases that we want to power, can we really truly do that if we haven't invested in building some of these products? And I think they'll, they'll quickly say like, hey, it's worth the investment, but instead of us going in and spending you know, a ton right up front to build the perfect architecture, why don't we go in one of our divisions, in one of our groups and start building this out for our customers? or build this out for our suppliers or build it out in, in, in a domain and have a data product manager and then start using some of these tools and get going and then prove the value. Again, build the momentum to build the momentum, so, so right? One of the things you were, you were mentioning on, on, on what's next is humanizing data. And just seeing here in the chat, Josh is saying about like, should the data engineering be separated from software engineering or should they be considered a specialty of it? And like you think about even in software, you have user experience, right? You have user interfaces, user experience. What is the user experience of data? I mean, that's something we need to think about. For me, it's always been like, I want, I want, I want a, a data, a, a data consumer to look at the data. And by looking at the data, I mean, like a look at a data model. It should be simple. And they should be able to say, I want to, I, they can follow their, their, their finger on a graph. Oh, an order is placed by a customer, a customer is in an address. I, I want to have a report that gives me this thing and they follow it on the graph. Give me that data. And it should be as simple as, okay, here's the query that follows that model. Super simple. It, I don't, I mean, we, we've, we've, we've gone into this whole world of managing data uh, to, to, to support the applications and not to support the actual consumers of data. And I think this is the big disconnect. So we really need to think about what is a user experience for data? That's yeah, and I, again, I think it also varies on the different personas, right? The, um, yeah. the you know, who, who, are, who are the insight, who, who are developing insights, who are, actually building out the data products and who are maybe even building analytics. Like one of the things, this is kind of like a dream of mine is to see a world where you have your data as a product, you have these entities that people you know, may have agreed on, you've exposed them, you've created almost like an NLP engine on top of it. And then you can go and ask questions. You can truly ask questions of your data and get results. You don't have to write SQL to do it. You can have business people ask questions. You can, and you know, look, at the end of the day, I do think domain expertise is so important when it comes to data in the sense that it's really important that when I talk about humanizing data, it's, it's you know, for those who are familiar with BI, right? There's a lot of reports out there. People look at it. Some operating reports are great. You see some metrics change time to time. But the reality is I think data producers, have a responsibility to a certain extent to work with their business partners to ask the questions on what are you, what like to put themselves and be empathetic to the consumers and say what is it that you want to drive and change in your business what are the hypotheses how can i actually create analysis that will truly change the way you make decisions and that requires 
that requires fundamentally not, not just producing a nice BI dashboard or producing an analysis. It actually under, it requires understanding the problem. And so you, I think you'll see a world, two, two things happening. One is that more and more, the more successful data practitioners are going to be spending tons of time with their business partners. And they're really going to be understanding the problems and they're going to actually help their business partners think about new problems they can go solve that maybe the business problem, the business partner didn't think about. And the second thing you'll probably be seeing happening is that the business partners who understand the data and understand the potential of it will increasingly be looking for tools that help them answer questions uh, you know, in, 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 a, in a faster, in more expedient way. And I, I, again, I think data products will help with that. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. And I think that's super exciting. And, and the, the last thing you said was external data, right? And how does that, quickly, how does that come into play? Yeah, so, you know, as many of us have been, you know, having our own challenges, getting our internal data together, the external data universe has been expanding you know, very quickly, some sources say oh, there's over 5,000 new data sources that are available. Everything from, you know, uh, foot traffic data to spending data to social media comments and reviews. And you start to find out that there's so many powerful use cases on customer analysis, on also um, prospecting, uh, on competitive benchmarking, understanding your organization's health relative to others, that you can use external data to help inform. And I think organizations that really start thinking about where are their use cases where either strategic analyses or analytics use cases where external data could give light um, or could, could shine some additional insight will have an edge. They will have an edge, but it does require, uh, it does require, um, and you know, I'm familiar with this because I've gone through this journey is having these sort of um, data scouts or these data experts who are partnering with your with your, your business and your practices, if you will, and helping them understand, helping, under, helping kind of understand what their problems are and then understanding sort of the availability of data out there to then start problem solving and playing this translator role to say, here's data that you could use to change the way you know, your group makes decisions or how your organization makes decisions. And again, it comes back to this point still the external data is there. You still need to humanize it. You still need those translator roles uh, to make it to make it happen. Hey, Mo, I told you 30 minutes fly by. We can keep talking. And here's the cool thing for folks who are listening to this podcast. If you join live, you can actually join part, be part of the after party. So we always want to wrap up. I, we always uh, kind of sum up with our takeaways. Tim, take it away with your takeaways. My takeaway of takeaways. So um, first of all, um, I really liked your comment, Mo, about uh, sort of data culture and how you, you know, you may be approached by five or 10 teams and, you know, the key is that you're trying to build relationships with everyone, right? And, 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 I, and I love that and tying it back to momentum, right? Momentum starts with one person pushing what needs to be pushed and evangelizing and then, and then growing it out from there. So I, I, I love that and the personal touch that's associated with that. And I feel like, that, that feels like a really key ingredient to being an excellent CDO. Um, and then secondly, uh, I loved your comment about changing the paradigm where we're really trying to make it so the data is accessible, that people are enabled across the organization uh, and that time to insight is as fast as possible. You know, And you mentioned things like even natural language and other types of new approaches that hopefully can start to lower the bar and make it so that data literacy isn't having a stats degree or something like that. It's really making it so that everyone can be a part of that. Well, I got I, my, I got a, a handful here. One, your chief data officer is really a good data entrepreneur. And, and I, I really love that. Who's it? So ask yourself, who's the entrepreneur of data within your organization? Who's focusing on innovation, doing new things with data? Yeah, what's the next thing on engineering and architecture? And I love to connect with what Tim said, the data enablement, you're building a culture. So those are kind of the key things of a CDO. Also ask yourself, who are the consumers of your data? And, and, and how to avoid, I have to say it, boil in the ocean, right? Take a persona-based approach, right? Build momentum around that for those personas. And, uh, and what's next? Data is a product, external data. I think this whole notion of data scouter, data hunters or a data concierge service, right? Those tied to the business to help you solve problems and humanize data. And I think the big, another big takeaway is what's our user experience for data? So Mohammed, to wrap up two questions, well, final two questions. Number one, 
what's your advice? Just, yeah, very broad, open question. What's your advice? And second, who should we invite next? And you're muted. You're Sorry, lost. yes, so on the, on the advice, question um i so i guess one of one of my friends shared this piece with me that uh, you know there's an 80 20 rule the pareto principle you know 20 percent or 20 percent of things that come for 80 percent right and you can you can kind of be efficient that way i, I kind of believe in the 98 2 rule which is spend two percent of your energy uh building the right friends and surrounding yourself with the right people and 98 percent of your life uh gets solved for you Nice. I love that. And who should we invite next? And then, um, you know, I think it would be cool. Uh, you know, I, I've been avidly reading a lot around the knowledge graph space. Um, and I think Dan McCreary has published some great insights. It'd be great to, to invite him and learn from him on his experiences. All right. Well, definitely, Dan, hopefully you're, if you're listening. Otherwise, we're going to go reach out and get you invited. Mohammed, pleasure. Tim, as always, love our Wednesdays uh, chat here. Uh, cheers. Happy cheers. Wednesday, everybody. Thank you, Mo.